Susan Sontag, Susan Sontag Grace Paley. But then also yeah. local poets um, mm -hmm. open mic in the United States. You know, the size of the room has changed. So mm -hmm. um, for all of you that play music out here, um, although everybody seems to be laughing. Yeah. <laughs> um, upstairs we have classrooms that are used for uh, student magazine publications at mm -hmm. night and also um, for student publications, mm -hmm. also community groups. There's a kitchen that the students use to like bake cookies, and yeah, yeah, it's, it's hard house. to teach here because sometimes you're smelling like this really amazing food and, and you're starving. But yeah, it's, like, it's funny. We think yeah. somewhere along the way discovered that eating is very much a part of community building and thriving. So yeah, sometimes what we're doing is just enough. <laughs> and every event is free. Like there's there's never Everything a charge. Free and yeah. Just about everything we do is free and open to the public. Mm -hmm. So like when David Sedaris came, if you reserved in time, you would get a spot. But they're not going to move him to, <coughs> to a giant auditorium at Penn, even though he could fill it, because the whole concept is that it has to be in this Intimate. place. Yeah. yeah. There is like overflow. There, sometimes they put a screen out there, and people can. I've been in at, meet, at events that were so big that I was watching from a closed circuit on the other side of that wall. But yeah. And then some of the events are simultaneously broadcast. All of them are. Oh, they are? Oh. Unless you say don't broadcast. Oh, so this will be broadcast? Just okay. the <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, to, yeah. to yeah. Irvine Auditorium, which is totally full, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Since you have ah. lunch, we can talk about it. Who is that for? Kathleen Hanna from the Queen's Club. Oh. Bless. I didn't yeah. know who that is. I didn't yeah. know who that yep. is. Yep. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a wonderful, I think it's transformed Penn into like a really wonderful center for writers, which, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's great, it's terrific. And then some, you know, there's there's a, there's a, two classrooms here, um, one in the front, it's a little bit bigger, probably seats maybe 15 happily, and there's, um, you know, it's wired, it's a, it's a smart classroom, and then there's a little library space, very informal, with no, um, no, with no electronics in the back, so it's, it's fun to teach in this place. Is it all um, it's it's mixed. I mean, yeah. I think most of the classes are undergraduate classes, but um, any anyone in the Penn community is welcome to be part of um, the planning committee, the hubs, and in, not even the Penn community. In I guess in the whole Philadelphia writing community. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely inclusive. Some events will naturally draw people from outside of the Penn community, and some are more sort of campaign dependent. But yeah, but it is. So we get we also get visiting students from other colleges, and you know, the last. The last one of these events we had, I had, there was someone from a college in New Jersey who came to observe because he's thinking of doing something like that there. So, nice. um, so that that was, you know, we, we get things like that. Um, are there still people uh, gather, gathering lunch? No, okay, maybe we'll we'll begin. Okay, um, I'd like to. My name is Karen Ryle, and I um, am on the creative writing faculty here at Penn. Um, and um, I, this year, I am help. I am sort of co-hosting with Writer's House, the Applebaum Editors and Publishers Series, um, which is um, a series funded by the Applebaum family, um, which um, <laughs> brings editors and publishers to Kelly Writer's House for events. And we're doing it as four lunchtime events um, in, con in concert with my advanced fiction writing class, which I've done as a sort of uh, literary magazine intensive class. So what we're doing in our class, and also for the series, is bringing in editors from four different magazines throughout the semester um, and instead of using a bulk pack or bringing in our own literary magazines as the reading portion of our class, we're reading specifically for magazines. And we chose a very kind of wide range of magazines to use. We, we started with Apiary Magazine, which came on October 7th, I believe, some, uh, early in October. Um, Apiary is a relatively new magazine, two years old, um, that was put together by recent graduates of Swarthmore College. And um, they're a Philadelphia-based magazine. They do a lot of community in, in uh, events, um, everything from like uh, spoken word poetry events to open mic nights to partnering with other magazines and cultural institutions. And um, they're a very popular, vibrant young magazine. Um, the second magazine we brought in is the Painted Bride Quarterly, which is also Philadelphia based. They um, have been in existence since the early 70s. Originally as an independent magazine, the way APRA is not funded by any outside source, 
but over the years they've been hosted first by Rutgers in New Jersey and now by Drexel University. So they are in a totally different position as a magazine in which they are independent in terms of like their um, editorial control of their of their magazine, and yet they have funding from Drexel University, which gives them um, a kind of buffer and the kind of relief to have like a staff and and student co-op workers and um, you know just like more flexibility in terms of like how they run their operations. So that's a nice, interesting contrast of to bring in a magazine that's further along and has those types of um, capabilities. The next magazine we brought in was One Story Magazine, which is an which is an independent nonprofit um, in Brooklyn. And some of you were here for the One Story presentation. They are uh, a very unusual magazine in that they print just one story and they um, publish it. They publish one story every three weeks during a nine-month period. Um, and they are available only through subscription. You can't walk into a store, buy a copy of one story. You have to subscribe over the mail, and there is no electronic distribution. They have a very nice website with a blog, a lot of author interviews, um, but for content of the stories, you need to be a subscriber. So, and they really do adhere to that sort of um, idea. That and their mission is is to bring this like one beautiful story. Um, the mag there's no illustration, but there's a lot of attention you can see to the design in terms of like you know the typeface <coughs> is chosen and the way the um, the magazine is produced. So you have this one beautiful soft back story every week. Um, so by contrast, um, for a very large contrast to one story, we, we also are bringing in for our final um, presentation elect the editors, two editors from Electric Literature, which is an all, um, I guess, an all electric based magazine. There are um, available print um, annual, I guess, well these are not the print issues, um, which are sort of print on demand. Um, so you, you can have the opportunity to buy a print copy, but the whole point of electric literature is that um, electric literature is reproduced in every possible electronic way. Um, all, all viable. Right, formats, right. So you, you can you can get a Kindle copy. You can get a an iPad copy. You can get a PDF um, if you subscribe. You you get to even choose which issues you want, and it's mailed to you instantly um, if it exists already. Or you can wait for the next issue to come out. Um, you can also get an audiobook version. Um, yeah, with, with some of our stuff, uh, we also have audiobooks embedded in our apps, uh, mm -hmm. so it's also right. So there's a lot of different ways t to like enjoy these stories, which are um, usually authored by mainstream, fa fairly well established authors. Um, and there's, as you can see, also there's a tremendous um, one story. By contrast, has no illustrations, and the graphic content is kept to like just design issues of the typeface, um, whereas. Um, these Thanks. are very heavily, um, y you get to, to see a lot of uh, illustrations. Perhaps in the print issues, you're not seeing as much of the internal illustrations, but um, you can see that, that, you know, that art is a big point, a, a big part of that. And also you have a, on your blog, you've got um, um, playlists, um, mm -hmm. music play musical playlists. Okay, so um, I'd like to introduce two editors. Kalima Marcus is the managing editor of Electric Literature. Um, she's an MFA candidate in fiction at Brooklyn College and her writing can be found in Philadelphia Noir, The Fiction Desk, and The Fiddleback. That's right. And this is Benjamin Samuel. He's the online editor of Electric Literature. He combats spam bots on the outlet, which is their blog, which is a very active publication, which is in addition to the Electric Literature mm -hmm. website, a lot of content. Mm -hmm. um, and he facilitates procrastination on the Electric Literature Twitter feed. Yep. Okay, welcome, and thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having us. Um, thank you all for coming. Like Karen said, I'm Halima, and um, I'm the managing editor at Electric Literature. And I'm, I'm Ben, I'm the online editor. So we're gonna start by just doing a sort of 10 minute presentation that involves some movies um, about Electric Literature, just so you can get an overview of what we do, go in depth a little bit more to some of the points that Karen already made. Um, so <coughs> Electric Literature was founded two years ago by Scott Lindenbaum and Andy Hunter, who met in the Brooklyn College MFA program. And you know, we're hearing a lot of negativity around the state of the publishing industry, like, you know, it's going under, it's the end of books, it's the end of writing, it's the end of reading. You know, that was sort of like the doomsday vibe that everyone was uh, propagating. So they had a different idea. They had a more optimistic view of the situation. 
So we're going to begin, you, you'll, you can meet them since they couldn't make it today, uh, with a video from our Issue 5 launch party, which was at Housing Works, a bookstore in New York. Electric Literature is the publication dedicated to using digital media and innovative technology to keep literature a part of popular culture. We do things like use Twitter and YouTube, as well as publishing to the iPad, iPhone, Kindle, basically using all of this different technology that has sprung up in the past 10 years to bring home the idea that reading a great book is an indulgence, it's something that is a great pleasure, and part of that is throwing events and parties like we're doing tonight. Tonight was our first event at Housing Works. We try to throw events as often as we can because even though reading is something that happens alone, it's uh, part of a community, and we like to bring as many communities together as possible. So tonight we had three readers, Ben Greenman, uh, Lynn Tillman, and J. Robert Lennon all come down. We showed a film by one of our other writers, Carson Mell, and now Elizabeth Harper from the Brooklyn-based band Class Actress is DJing. And that allows us to bring a lot of different crowds together to have a great time. Harpoon sponsored it. We love Housing Works a lot. Um, so yeah, that was, that was from our, our fifth issue launch party. Um, and EL has been around for about two years now. Um, and after our first year of publishing, um, Andy, who you, you met in the video, uh, wrote an article, sort of a manifesto um, for Publishers Weekly. And in that, he, he made a point that, that part of our success is due to our ability to recognize that the publishing industry is changing uh, and that we should adapt. Um, so if you'll, if you'll bear with me, we'll get into a point here of uh, the parable of the ark. Um, so we'll just do a quick little read along. Um, so once upon a time, a farmer named Noah noticed a frightening change in the weather. A practical man, he began building an ark uh, with which to preserve his family and the creatures of the world. Until one day, Noah's boss saw what he was up to. Noah, what the hell are you doing? The boss asked. The farm is what makes us money. The ark only costs us money. Knock it off and return to the fields. He did, and sure enough, the rain washed away the farm. Moral of the story, by the time an ark can prove its usefulness, it's too late to build it. Um, so rather than wait for a solution to, to all this doom and gloom and all the changes that, that were sort of threatening the publishing industry, uh, we essentially just decided to take action for ourselves and figure out a way that we could make publishing sustainable. Um, so our success and our mission is basically built around four main components. Uh, we have great writing from some of the, the best contemporary voices in American and international literature. Uh, we do a lot of multimedia collaboration. Um, as you can see from our cover art, uh, we also have a single sentence animation series uh, which brings together uh, a dialogue essentially between different disciplines. Um, we use innovative distribution um, to deliver literature to people in whatever format they choose to read in. And we use social media just to engage with our readers, promote literature, and uh, occasionally even publish fiction. So at the heart of electric literature is, of course, our content and getting it to people, you know, figuring out ways to get as many readers as possible. So we were the first literary magazine to publish on the iPhone because we saw these devices not as just a tool for distraction or procrastination, like not just for angry birds, but a place where you could read. You know, the iPhone is, if you have one or if you have a smartphone, it's, it's always in your pocket. So you can always have literature with you. And our um, iPhone and iPad apps, as well as our EPUBs and PDFs, contain audio and video. So single sentence animation for each story, as well as uh, an author reading, or if not an author, an actor reading of the story. And we also publish in formats that are accepted by virtually every e-reader, so whatever way you've gotten into this new sort of e-reading thing, whatever way you're comfortable with, we want to accommodate that. And if it's paper, we accommodate that as well. Um, so rather than fret about the potential demise of the printed word, we believe that the content is more important than the medium. So wherever or however you're publishing, you have to publish work that people want to read. I mean, that's the most essential point. So our focus is on great writing, like Ben said. Um, we've published novel excerpts from writers like Michael Cunningham and Kevin Brockmeyer, and we have published transmission, translations from Javier Marias. We did a, a sort of dark fable called Baba Enga and the Penguin Child by Joy Williams, a little unusual story for her. A very interesting recursive nonlinear story by Lydia Davis called The Cows. Uh, Jim Shepard's story from our first issue, Your Fate Hurdles Down at You, which is about um, 
avalanche researchers won the Penn O'Henry Prize this past year, which is a, a big literary prize, so that was great for us and for him. And also J. Robert Lennon's story from issue five and Jenny Offal's story from issue three were selected as uh, distinguished stories of 2010 by the Best American Short Stories. So although we do have you know, these more established writers, we also want to focus on pairing them with emerging voices, you know, because what is a better way to get someone to read an emerging voice than if it comes after a Michael Cunningham story? So we have a completely open submission period, and we tell people not to send cover letters, and we read with a double-blind process where you don't know who the author is. And we get thousands and thousands of stories that come in, and a lot of our time is spent going through, it's called, the, you know, in the industry it's called the slush pile, which you may have heard. Um, so we actually, you know, it's a lot of work to go through the slush pile, and um, in our most recent issue, issue six, we had our very first slush pile successor, which was <laughs> Steve Edwards, who made it through all the thousands of stories. He wrote Daily Bread, um, which is a story about... That was our favorite. Oh, really? Yeah. That's, you know, we've been hearing that. It's great. Yeah. It's a, um, about starvation. That we never all agree about slush pile. <laughs> yeah. It's imagined, like, you know, it's an imagined history of World War II in which there are starvation experiments for conscientious objectors. Um, another emerging voice that we've published actually twice is Matt Summel, um, and he's a person to pay attention to because it seems like he's about to be showing up other places. Um, so really what we focus on is giving you a cover-to-cover -cover reading experience. You know, it's five stories, each one of which we hope is electric, like our name suggests, grabs you in the beginning and brings you through to the end. And we've had lots of people tell us that this is the only literary magazine they've read front to back, probably besides one story. <laughs> you can't make it through one story. <laughs> and they publish great writing as well. Um, so yeah, we're really focusing on compelling content. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the culture that, that we uh, promote. Um, so to us, the, the changes in the publishing landscape really means new ways to engage with the literary community. Um, and it also means opportunities to experiment with what it means to actually be a publisher. Um, so in the fall of 2009, we published this story called Some Contemporary Characters by uh, this handsome gentleman, Rick Moody. Um, so what was remarkable about that story is that Rick wrote it for Twitter, um, which meant that he wrote 153 segments of 140 characters or less. Um, and since it was you know, written for Twitter um, and meant to be tweeted, that's pretty much exactly what we did. Um, so over the course of three days, uh, we tweeted the story every 10 minutes, um, <laughs> and uh, you know it, it wound up capturing the attention of you know like literary blogs who were who were interested in what we were doing. But it also kind of blossomed then into national and international mainstream media. Um, and uh, you know we we learned that you know it might not be the best platform for <laughs> consuming literature, um, <laughs> but because of Rick's story, you know people were actually using Twitter to talk about literature um, as opposed to like just what they ate for lunch that day. Um, so that was, that was a success in its own right. Um, but as a result of that experiment, um, our Twitter presence expanded. Uh, at the time we had about 1,000 followers and then we grew from that to 150,000. Um, so at, at that time it was more than any other publisher that was out there from literary magazines to you know, the big six. Um, and now we use that, that same Twitter presence to communicate with the readers, share news, projects from other publishers, um, and just anything that we, we kind of find relevant to the literary community. Um, and you know, the literary community is, is really what this is all about. Um, and, and we're really trying to establish you know, sort of a, a sense of togetherness. Um, our publishing model, which we found was successful, was never a secret, for example. Um, we were very transparent about what we were doing, how we were doing it. Um, and so, uh, in, in that spirit, you know, we, we try to connect writers with new readers, and we try to connect writers with artists they wouldn't otherwise work with. Um, so for a single sentence animation series, um, every writer we publish picks one, uh, one sentence from their story, and then we send that to an animator. They create a unique work of art that's scored by another musician, um, and then you know, we, we post those on YouTube, we embed them in our apps. Um, and we've received over like, 100,000 views, I think, on, on YouTube at this point, um, and they're all actually being re released on theatlantic.com. And this is um, the animation for Three by Mark Bash, which is in issue six. And um, 
this isn't released on our website, so this is effectively its world premiere. <laughs> so, big deal. Essentially, I mean, it's, it's sort of like a stop motion animation, but it's, it's painted. Um, and our, the, the artists that we work with have free reign to do whatever they want. Um, they just you know, have to be inspired by the sentence. Um, and, uh, but, you know, some, some of our videos are, are less focused on the arts and, and literature um, and are just a little bit more educational, um, such as this uh, PSA that we did. Can a book save your life? That's not metaphorical. That's reality. At Electric Literature, we're serious about books. We're also serious about keeping you safe. So we posed a question. Of all the big books that came out in 2010, which would be the most likely to protect you in the event of a shooting? John, you ready? Let's go for it. Let's shoot some books. OK, let's see how some of these books fared. We've got David Mitchell's new novel here. Looks like it's actually pretty clean here, but if you notice, one went clean through and really destroyed the back end. So, not going to live with that one. Jonathan Franzen, my wife loves this guy. He refused to go on Oprah. Now she's given him a book award, but uh, look. He's still dead. Jonathan, though, he's, he's still doing well, so. Kindle. Some people wondered how this would fare because it's kind of a Seems like a solid piece of equipment, but obviously, look at that, clean right through. The only consolation is uh, you're going to die quickly with a Kindle. The Four Fingers of Death, an apropos title from Rick Moody, a friend of electric literature, but sorry, Rick, your novel did not protect us. The Instructions, Adam Levin. Now this I had high hopes for. Look at the size of this book, and it's in hardcover. I mean, it's a, it's a hefty book, uh, but no, look at this. Not good. This, this is McSweeney's readers. They're reading this in bad neighborhoods. It should protect you from a gun. <laughs> you hear me, Dave? Now this is a surprise. Paperback novel by Joshua Cohen. Vitz is the title. Look at this. Almost intact. The bullet went in. It did... Oh, look, there's, pe there's pieces of bullets in the book. Look at this. Something came out the back here, but if it didn't stop the bullet, it did slow it down. So the most protective book of 2010, Vitz. <laughs> so, very educational. Um, another major component of our publishing is community. And, you know, as Scott mentioned in the video that you saw, we try to hold as many events as we can. So this past year, I'm just going to highlight a couple things that we did. We had an event with um, Symphony Space for their selected shorts, um, which many of you are probably familiar with the podcast. And uh, we read John Lithgow, read an electric literature story, as did Mike, Ver Mike Verbiglia, who uh, you may know from like His American Life. And in tandem with it, we ran a short, short contest that was judged by Rick Moody. Um, 
who, you know, made sure to tell us to send him all the weird ones. That was his stipulation. Um, so the winner read her story at Symphony Space, and the podcast of that evening just came out a few weeks ago on the Symphony Space podcast, if, if you're a subscriber. I think it was called, like, Dogs and Dates, maybe, mm-hmm. or something like that. So you can, you can listen to that. Um, and also at the Brooklyn Book Festival, which is uh, really a fun time in Brooklyn, if you can ever go up for it, we did a launch party with Tin House at the Powerhouse Arena, which is a bookstore in Dumbo. Um, which is the picture on the right there. And um, it was a launch also for our issue six. And we had a band play, which was fun. And then this, what you see in the picture is this guy, Matt Kitsch, Kish, speaking um, about his book where he illustrated every page of Moby Dick. And so he was giving a presentation on his process. It's the illustrations are beautiful, and it's actually like a pretty affordable book. It's like big, but it's only it's like $39 or something for what it is. I thought it was going to be a lot more than that, but he used recycled papers um, from the library where he worked to paint. So that was just, you know, one example of an instance where we're partnering with other magazines, other publishers to try to reach new audiences rather than competing over the same audiences. Um, We've also, you know, had parties on rooftops in New York's meatpacking district, which like made us feel very fancy. Mm -hmm. And concerts with like writers bands like Myla Goldberg who has a band um, she also has a December song dedicated to her if you're familiar with that band um, and and like the housing works party which you saw earlier um, so that's electric literature on the ground uh, we're also on the web um, and so we have the outlet which is our blog um, and one of the, the main columns is actually called the dish um, and that's coverage of literary events and readings launch parties um, and the, the conception of that idea was um, we wanted to revive the idea of you know, literature as something glamorous and, and the sort of idea of a literary celebrity and kind of getting you know, people out there and, and interested in, in these readings that are going on all around the country. Um, and originally we started with just one blogger in Brooklyn. Um, and now, just a little over a year later, uh, we've got dozens of bloggers from coast to coast. Um, so we're able to cover events from other magazines, other cities, um, which is really exciting. Um, but we also have interviews uh, you can see there. Um, we do book reviews, literary news, um, and as I mentioned before, we have these monthly mixtapes where we've taken a, an author and asked them to curate a mixtape for us, um, and they can you know, pick whatever themes they want. And, and so J. Robert Lennon has done one, Rick Moody's done one. Uh, Rick Moody's done a lot. For, for us, yeah. <laughs> wanted to close by encouraging everyone to read literary magazines if you have an interest in them. I mean, I, for a long time, sort of was like, yeah, literary magazines are cool, but, like, didn't read any of them. So whether it's ours or another, just subscribing is really important. Um, We do have issues for sale, though, today. Um, But, you know, a literary magazine is the only place where you can find an emerging voice next to established voice, and you can support a writer while they're trying to get their collection together um, and participate in a really vibrant and dynamic culture. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. So we're not done. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to open it up the floor to questions. And um, we have a mic here. And I guess Kala um, will take the mic around. The reason for the mic isn't for amplification. Obviously, it's a small room, but it's so that it can be picked up on the recording. So if you just you know raise your hand, she'll bring it over to you, and you, and you can ask your question into the mic. How long should we wait if we've submitted to follow up? Because I know you guys have a lot of slush, and you know I'm thinking you know it probably takes months to even just get through some of this stuff. So. What's reasonable as far Reason- as Well, what's reasonable or what's real? <laughs> what's real? <laughs> um, you know, we say six months, but it can be up to a year, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, I mean, are you, you're talking specifically for us or yeah, for living? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you know, we found that, that um, you know, the, the, with success, the more interest we have, the more submissions we get. Um, but ultimately, we're still the same size staff. Um, so originally, we, we tried to, we started, I think, with, with a one-month turnaround. And that turned to three, and that turned to six. Um, 
so you know it's it's playing a lot of catch up, but we take each story seriously. Um, so every story is is read by at least two different people, um, which just takes a lot of time. So yeah, and they write comments. It's more like Sisyphus. I mean, like you can never get to the bottom <laughs> <laughs> or the top in his case. Um, so. I may have missed this, but um, what are your subscription subscription rates? And also, do you pay your writers? Yeah, um, well the, the, the payment of writers um, is actually a really important aspect of electric literature for us. Um, and because of the way that we publish, um, you know, we, we do print on demand and, and print publishing is really what costs publishers a lot of money because you have distribution, you have storage, um, you have all these, these issues with you know, just getting the content out there. Um, so because we do print on demand, we have a very low overhead um, and the money that we save in printing goes right back to the writers. So we pay each writer $1,000 per story. Um, there's five stories an issue. Um, and ultimately, you know, we believe that um, you know, if you're supporting the writers, you're supporting the community at large. Um, and that's more than, you know, probably the only magazines that you would find that pay writers more than that would be like the New Yorker or maybe even Paris Review. I don't know how much they pay, but it's definitely very high for literary magazines, which is probably why we get so many submissions. <laughs> <laughs> um, piggybacking onto that, I, I noticed the, some of the animations that you make are extremely labor intensive, like mm -hmm. the one you just showed us with the house um, paintings, stop motion. Um, do you pay the animators as well? Or? We give the animators a stipend for the animator of just $100. Mm -hmm. For the animators, it's more of um, you know something that they do because they're interested in and they like the magazine, and it's exciting for them to collaborate with um, with authors, you know, Nathan Englander just ha showed his animation at Bryn Mawr College when he was speaking there, mm -hmm. and um, you know, emailed the animator and was so grateful. And Norak Bash was like, "I want to buy the paintings that mm -hmm. like were in this." So it's a we we hope that that is incentive enough because we give all our money to our writers. And yeah. then same <laughs> with the composers, <laughs> the film scores. Yeah, and, and ultimately, you know, it's, it's a great way for them to get their work out there in just a new way. Um, mm -hmm. So instead of just gallery shows or, or however they're, they're pushing out their art, um, they can work with us and then we help promote it online. Mm -hmm. and, um, if we say and you know, how do you find the animators? Um, actually, uh, our founding editor, Andy, uh, is pretty uh, connected in the, the art community. Mm -hmm. um, his wife is an artist. She actually did the uh, cover of our fifth issue. Um, Which is a, it's a woodcut. The shocking cover. It's a yeah, woodcut. The controversial Did you guys cover. hear that? Um, so, yeah, we, we have some, some connections there, um, and we just tend to try and find some, some art that's really sort of popping um, mm -hmm. and, and will really catch your eye when you're seeing it next to all these other magazines on the shelf, essentially. Yeah, sometimes you can get things by just asking, which mm -hmm. is exciting. Um, but to answer your earlier question about sub subscription rates, digital subscriptions are $16 and paper subscriptions are 32 Paperbacks are 10 for a single issue and um, digital issues are $5, no matter what format. Um, and we're also running a holiday special right now where you can buy all six issues for $35. So, so when you say a subscription is X amount, you mean for the year? Yeah, for the year. Which is three issues? Four. Four issues. Um, and actually, it's sort of an interesting thing to just uh, dovetail off of that. Um, you know, we don't do like a, a spring or a summer or a fall issue. Nothing is really seasonal um, because you know, we consider them sort of anthologies that stand alone on their own right, no matter what time of year it is. Um, so actually, uh, in um, our first issue, the novel excerpt from, from Michael Cunningham, that's the only place where you can find that large portion of the novel because when it was released, um, that was cut. So that will always sort of exist and will always be on sale. Um, and, and it's really the only place you can find something like that. Yeah, in the, in the issue, it's called Olympia, but the novel's actually by Nightfall, mm -hmm. which you may have heard of. How did you manage to get such well-established writers right out of the box? Um, well, uh, our founding editors went to Brooklyn College for their MFA. Um, it's also where we're both doing our MFAs, um, and at the time, Michael Cunningham was uh, the head of the program. So when Scott and Andy said that they had this idea for this new magazine um, as, as sort of a, a vote of confidence, um, Michael Cunningham said he would publish this, this excerpt with them. Um, but then from there, uh, it was just a lot of um, 
kind of just <coughs> going out there and, and as, as Ling said, just asking. Um, so the Jim Shepard story, which is in our first issue, um, Andy likes to tell this, this story where he, um, he really wanted to publish Jim Shepard and he wrote him an email and eventually wound up driving all the way out to Massachusetts just to sit down for a cup of coffee because he said, you know, I know that there are a million editors who are asking for a story, but I want to be the one editor who came out just to buy you a cup of coffee. And, uh, and it worked. And even with Michael Cunningham, it wasn't that easy. You know, It's not always simple for, for writers to excerpt novels, different novel excerpts, because they have agreements with their publishers. So that was a battle. And you know, so for the first issue, it was a lot of like stick to it um, to, to get these people to give us their stories. And as, as Lima mentioned before, we do have a, a double blind process where any manuscript that we're considering uh, is, is given to all the editors, editorial staff without a name. Um, so that means that someone from, from our submissions account who's unsolicited, doesn't have an agent, is read alongside um, a really established voice. Um, and so, you know, just sort of naturally everything kind of progresses and um, we wind up occasionally even rejecting writers that we all really admire. Ultimately, you know, we, we have the process that we believe in and the process that we stand by. Um, is it not awkward to reject a writer that you may have solicited? Um, it is, and it's probably not advisable. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it's it is something that that, that we believe in. Um, I mean, is there this horrible aha moment when it's revealed that you've rejected a story by John Cheever, although dead? Yeah, um, <laughs> I don't think he would yeah. mind. Yeah. <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is it is sometimes heartbreaking because you know we're we're also readers and we're also writers mm -hmm. and we, we do really have a personal connection you know just in our own lives with these writers um, and so turning down one of their stories is it, it can sometimes be sort of heartbreaking. I don't mean heartbreaking. I mean it seems like it might be politically dangerous. Yes. yes. Yeah, it can be. I mean, you really want to try to only solicit writers that you feel very confident. Um, you know, at times when we solicit a writer, then haven't story's not ready, we've worked with writers for a year before it's ready. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's generally the approach that you would take if you solicited something. Uh, excluding animation, you mentioned a thousand dollars for an article. Um, well, uh, is, is there a general length, for example, uh, would say ten, a 10 page article, 2,500 words? Do you, do you have an average length for articles? Yeah, for well, we've, dollars about? we publish yeah. only fiction, so um, no nonfiction articles, but our recommended length is uh, 2,000 to 8,000 words, although we have gone up to 10,000 words. 10,000 words. Um, and then anything that's sh shorter than 1,500, uh, we, we will consider for the blog, but we don't publish in the magazine. Well, well a 10,000 word article, if you accept. Uh, might be the same then as the fifteen hundred word, the basic thousand dollars. Yeah, there's no yep. pay, no paying per word. It's it's the same for for each one. And every it's dangerous to pay fiction writers <laughs> by the word. <laughs> but uh, ev every writer too gets the same pay rate. Um, so if they're unsolicited or if they're established, everyone gets paid a thousand dollars. You mentioned several times that you have a lot of different, um, I guess, like media that you can. Um, like platforms for the subscriptions, and I was just wondering which like platform is the most popular in terms of subscription sales. Mm. Um, I would say, you know, paperback is still pretty popular, but um, in the beginning, our iPhone app was extremely popular. Um, and then I, I think it probably at this point, EPUB, because it's a little bit, or maybe Kindle. <laughs> it's pretty evenly distributed, yeah. actually. Probably Kindle has, has a slight advantage um, just because they have a much larger user base um, than, than some of the other e-readers. Um, but EPUB, I think, will, will probably be um, the format that, that is most popular going forward just because it's, it's more universal. Um, so it can work on, uh, on your computer and on an iPhone or on your Android. Um, but it's been interesting, you know, I've seen in the last year a real change with some of our earlier subscribers who maybe began by subscribing through PDF, which is sort of like a non-intimidating entryway into doing an e-subscription. 
because you don't have to have a device and you don't have to figure out how to get an EPUB reader plug-in on your computer. But all those people now are emailing me and being like, I, how do I read this on my Kindle? How do I read this on my iPad? So like those people, like I don't know what it was like last Christmas, but they all got <laughs> the Kindles and iPads. So they're switching their subscriptions over. Another question, because uh, because it goes through so many different formats, you distribute it so many different formats. I'm wondering, as you're making your sort of decisions as to what to publish, how that, you know, the whole medium is the message thing. Like, do you read a story and think, this would be a great for one sense animation. This would also be good as you know, as some sort of something or other. You know, in other words, it seems because you're in such a unique spot to publish in so many different ways that that would influence the kind of stuff you publish as well. I just haven't read enough of it to, to know myself, but I'm just kind of curious yeah. if you have a take on that. I think we believe the opposite, that the medium is not the message. I mean, that the content is more important than the medium, and it's the message of the content will surpass the medium. So um, I, we, uh, we don't consider, you know, it's a story. It's going to be text wherever it goes. Um, any story that we're going to want to publish is going to have a sentence in it that is going to inspire a great animation. You know, like I doubt, you know, you know, a story with all terrible sentences is not <laughs> going to be one that we're going to choose. So um, maybe you have a different take. Ultimately, those, those sentences are, are chosen by the writers themselves. Um, so even if we found a story that had like this, this sentence that we could, we could automatically see as, as becoming a great animation, um, the writer might not pick that. So it, it doesn't really work for us to, to, to choose stories based on what we plan to do with it after we publish it. Do you guys pick your <coughs> stories on a consensus basis? <coughs> I'm sorry, or do you, um, are there ever like strong disagreements amongst your staff about what should and shouldn't be published and how do you kind of work through those moments? Um, well, the, the way that uh, our sort of editorial process begins is um, a story will come in and it'll go to our readers who are all volunteer. Um, they're only compensated by, by getting copies of the issue that, that they read for. Um, and, and so we, we rely on them as, as sort of um, our, our first line of, I guess, aesthetic defense. Um, and uh, if one of them approves a story, they give it you know a response and a simple yes or no. Um, if a story gets a yes from either reader, it'll be bumped up to the next level um, and then from there, it, it rises up in the ranks until we have, um, you know, an editorial packet that started with a thousand stories, and then it's down to ten. <coughs> and those are the stories that will be in consideration for the final issue. Um, and in those meetings, they, they're, I mean, they're, they're amicable, um, but we always kind of, you know, someone will have their, their favorite story that they'll really be pushing for, and a lot of it does come down to taste in, in the end. Um, and everyone who everyone who works for electric literature who's in the office participates in the meeting. So interns, app developers, um, you know, no matter who's coming to work for us, no matter what they're gonna be doing, whether it's a technical thing or like a specific thing, their interest and taste in literature is important so that they can all participate. And it's, you know, it's not consensus. Um, I guess it's majority mm -hmm. rules. Um, in some cases, you know, like the editor in chief has more pull than like an intern, you know. It's not it's not a collective, um, but so yeah. So we have disagreements, but like it's one of the important things for working there is learning how to defend your taste and um, how to defend a story that you really believe in. And it's often the case that if someone is really passionate about a story and maybe in the beginning other people don't agree with them but they really passionately defend it and they can win people over mm -hmm. certainly and then sometimes you know if you just don't like a story but you see that all these people that you really respect do you just step back because it's just not your thing it's just not your taste but you could tell that you know probably 70 percent of the people that read it are going to think it's great yeah um, and that, that happens quite often where you know a non-linear narrative might not be to your liking, um, that that just might not be the kind of thing you're interested in reading, um, but you can recognize that, that the quality of writing is, is high enough that you know, um, it should be considered. Can you tell us something about the size of your staff and how um, an interested person might get to become a reader or to become an intern or you know somehow involved? 
Um, people just email us, <laughs> essentially, um, mm -hmm. and they say that they're interested in getting involved. Mm -hmm. um, some of our readers live all around the country okay, or internationally, nice. yeah. um, because a lot of the stories that, that we get are digital, mm -hmm. so we just email them out. Um, but our, our interns come, because we're Brooklyn-based, they're yeah. usually uh, fairly local. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we are, the size of our staff fluctuates. Right now, it's pretty small. Um, at its biggest, there might be the managing editor, the online editor, editor-in-chief, two or three assistant editors, and then like two interns. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much its largest size. So for, since we're going in to the winter, you know, it's a little bit smaller. In the summer, we get a little bigger. Mm -hmm. um, but the year-round, day-to-day employees are basically three. Is, anyone, <laughs> is it all full-time? Uh, um, it's, it's t time shrinks and expands mm -hmm. the amount of work. So sometimes it might be 20 hours. Sometimes mm -hmm. when an issue is about to come out, it might be 60 or 80 or, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Often the rule is as much time as you can as get. As much it. time as there is. Yeah, I mean, if I wanted to, I could do it 100 hours. I mean, I could read stories to, like, my eyes bled if I, mm -hmm. if I would, you know. So you have to sort of put a cap on it at a certain point. So one thing that was interesting when we... <coughs> We had the editor from one story come to our classroom. I think it's like there's a veneer of like here's this very obviously successful literary magazine, and we can see that. But what I think, and when young people are looking into sort of going into literary publishing as a career, what they're not seeing sometimes is that how how much work and how much dedication, you know, that a lot of these editors who have these wonderful positions and are immersed in this life also have full time jobs in another. Area and I guess what I'm asking is that um, how does your organization work in terms of that? I mean, are are most of, is most of your staff also working in another way to support their ability to be dedicated to this magazine? Well, we we um we don't have university funding, uh, right. for instance. So yes, yeah, and we're not a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, currently, although. which is interesting. I noticed. I looked that yeah. up on your website because I feel like it's interesting that we had a nonprofit, a for-profit, university funded, and then mm -hmm. a magazine that's really not incorporated yet. Yeah. So, so yeah. we are a for-profit magazine. Our money comes from selling our mm -hmm. issues. Uh, you know, it, one day in the future we may decide to be a nonprofit, mm -hmm. but right now we're a for-profit. Um, most of our staff is unpaid. Yeah, that's what I want. Um, yeah. And you know, those who are paid are not paid handsomely mm -hmm. um so it is something that needs to be it is a labor of love and, and the world needs to change but of course if you were just holding out as a capitalist to make money from your literary magazine that wouldn't yeah be you, mm -hmm. yeah if you want to make money don't just go mm -hmm. work for a literary magazine mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but actually something that we we also learned uh, fairly early on is that um you know w when we started it, the, the idea was that we would just spend all of our time reading stories and that's mm -hmm. just not the case. Mm -hmm. um, you know, about eighty percent of the time is, is spent on marketing and you know, PR and mm -hmm. trying to get interesting projects together. Um, and as much time as we would like to read, um, we also have to run some right. business. Right. And as a for-profit company, you're not eligible for a lot of grants, I suppose. Right. Yeah. yeah. We can do awards. We got an Innovations in Reading award from the National Book Foundation this past year, uh, but those are sort of few and far between. Mm -hmm. That grant making organizations that will allow for profit to apply. It's they're they're not that many. But speaking of marketing, I just want to tell you guys if you're interested that we just now have merchandise <coughs> on our website with this cover. Mm -hmm. uh, we have mugs, t shirts <laughs> and tote bags for those the brave among you. Um, so those are up now, which is fun. We're gonna see how they do Yep. If who we'll see we don't know yet if anyone's willing to wear a t-shirt with a naked wooden man on the cover but we'll find <laughs> out <laughs> we've, we've heard from actually a lot of people on, on the subway um, that they're afraid to read that, that copy you know they want like book covers or, or you know keep it kind of on their lap yeah. yeah um get, getting back to your uh, the general submissions thing and you have readers all over the country but mostly local in brooklyn like how many, like do you have like, first of all, do you have like scores of those readers? And then do you send like two or three readers the same story? Or how, like how does that all, that distribution thing work? We have about 20 readers and they each read five stories a week and each story gets sent to two readers. So the same set of five will go to two readers. 
and they both respond. Uh, and we do have people reviewing their responses, so we do kind of keep tabs to make sure that they're, they're staying on task and, and that the responses are, are helpful and thoughtful. Um, and they go through a vetting process before becoming readers. Mm -hmm. so, say someone in this room said, I want, I'd really love to be a reader for electric literature, they would just email you? Yeah, we're not mm -hmm. currently accepting new readers mm -hmm. or new interns, but um, the really spring is, or late, like, you know, like March is mm -hmm. like a really good time or spring to email about that stuff because that's usually when we are wanting, we're looking to, to bulk up and, and get new mm -hmm. people and get more interns. Do you also use interns to help with your events and that sort yeah, of thing? Yeah, yeah, that's a big thing and that's often what they say they liked doing the best when they leave. <laughs> is reading, sto everyone says that they liked reading stories mm -hmm. and working at events and I'm like, oh, you didn't like the data entry? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you would love that. Excuse me if somebody else has already asked this question. How do you find the people to do the animated shorts for the w one sentences? We just, uh, you know, look at different animations online and 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 ask them. And uh, you know, we we have an intern who is. Um, an animator herself, so she's you know has connections, and our editor in chief is uh, also connected to the art world. So just sort of keep an ear to the, to the ground. And so if you were an animator, could you approach Electric Literature? Oh, we would love for animators. Tell all your animator friends okay. to email us. Uh, we're always looking for more animators. That's something that we always need. It sounds like one of the messages that you're giving, which I think is really important for people to hear, is that how you get a lot of your best sort of talent is just, you just ask. It doesn't hurt to ask. It doesn't is hurt that, Yeah. Um, how do you steal yourself for that or is, do you? Um, I mean, you know, most of the time it's, it's through email, mm -hmm. which is pretty low pressure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we do like to have a, a sense of, of community because, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately um, we're, we're all in it for the same purpose of, of creating um, a good publication mm -hmm. and, and engaging uh, with, with writers, with readers, and supporting the literary community mm -hmm. um, and so people that believe in that are usually receptive and mm -hmm. those are people that we, we like to work with and who like to work with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah and I, I try to go to readings and um, if I'm really impressed mm -hmm. you know say someone hey send me a story and that's not a solicitation you know that's yeah. just like a suggestion right. and if I'm nervous or intimidated I just try to remind myself that I'm complimenting their work and it's work that not enough people are paying attention to, I can be sure. And so there's no way that they would ever hold that against me unless they're like a real jerk. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that, you know, cause sometimes I do have to be like, all right, I'm gonna go just like randomly speak to this person. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I try to think about. So you told me beforehand that you don't have any reader yourself. Oh right? yeah, I don't. Tell, so how I do how an iPhone with how, electric literature on my iPhone? How do you how do you like to experience the fi finished product of electric literature? Well, um, I read. I well, I've read all the stories like a million times before it ever mm -hmm. goes to print. But um, <laughs> but gen I read generally books, and then when I read, I do read on my computer a lot, like because we can't afford to print out mm -hmm. all the stories that get sent to us. So I read stories that we're considering always on my computer. And then I tend to read books in a book form. <laughs> Before you came to electric literature, um, were you a person who did most did a lot did a lot of reading online, literary reading online, or is that kind of an acquired ability? Um, I was not. I mean, I think that electric literature has has convinced me of of its value, mm -hmm. and also, you know, I think that. It, Publishing, we don't publish online. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I still think that has a little bit of a stigma. Um, but you know, I published online, like my one of my works, and of course, I want people to read that. I mean, it's just difficult to get people to pay mm -hmm. for things online. So a lot of online journals are free, and I think that as we're publishing more and more digitally and online, that stigma will slowly be erased. Like, mm -hmm. there's no reason why something that's published online or in an ebook is of lesser quality. Uh, you know, like bad writers 
self-publish or bad writers mm. publish online. Like Especially when, when work, work is online, it's a lot more accessible, ultimately. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. absolutely. But you're saying the paywalls <laughs> is an issue. It's hard to get people to pay for content on the internet. You yeah. Know? yeah that, that precedent has already been set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the internet, you have to be safe. Which is why, you know, which is why we don't publish online. We try to produce content that is designed and is a marketable item like a paperback would be. That's interesting. When I, when I first subscribed to Electric Literature, which was like about a year ago when I was thinking about different magazines possibly for this course, um, I didn't know how it would work. I thought there might be a paywall and I would then be allowed to like view it. Um, but instead, I got this PDF and I was like, great, I'll print it out. And then I realized it was 95 pages long, so I, I didn't. Um, <laughs> so I had this thing on my screen, but it just goes on and on forever. Um, which was just a really different experience for me. I don't think I've ever had a book that length myself in a PDF format um, online. And it was, it was just a very, it was different because I, I do read online, I, but I prefer books personally as yeah. a reader. I think that the general consensus in our office is that everyone prefers paper. Um, mm -hmm. Probably only yeah. half of us know how to use, have an e-reader and yeah. only half of them know how to use it. Um, that's really so. interesting. That's comforting. I figured you would all be like wired people with like chips in your brains and yeah. you know just well Scott in. certainly is. Mm -hmm. He yeah. always had wants to have the newest thing. Um, but in, in terms of the, the PDF thing, you know Jennifer Egan talked mm -hmm. about you know in, in her in uh, the Goon Squad right. the, the uh, PowerPoint chapter yeah. um, when she brought that chapter into her editors, um, she gave it to them digitally and she said you know read it on the mm -hmm. computer because there's there's timing of each slide right. there's audio. Um, and apparently, when she went in to meet with them, they had all just printed it out and, and just read it on, on the computer. Right. She course. also tried to compose that PowerPoint <laughs> thing by hand at first. She said, I mean, <laughs> just yeah, drawing. she realized that yeah. didn't work either. That's really funny. So it's, you know, it's like a challenge for I also noticed, so in preparation for y meeting you guys, I decided I would look at the PDF, but I also, oh, okay. Um, there's one issue is like you get this notice that you're going to get the PDF and then apparently I just left it in my inbox which has 9,000 messages in it and then it turns out it expires so I had to get you to reissue it. Yeah, to, that's yeah. been ha distribution yeah. like solving those nitty gritty distribution problems is is like an issue because there's not models for right, it. Right, it's new ter 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 incognita and then so I also purchased it as a Kindle and as an iPad um, application. And I noticed that it's not the same experience with each um, because issue six is supposedly enhanced in the PDF, but in my computer, which I just bought a few months ago, so it's pretty recent, um, Apple computer, um, couldn't, I didn't see the animations and I didn't see the sound. Oh, that's probably because you opened it in the wrong oh, I program. Opened it, I opened it in the wrong program. I opened it in Adobe Acrobat. Yeah, that's the Oh, is that the last correct, actually? Oh. Well, we can we can look at it. I don't want so, to. But it was just a different experience. And then I came to class, and everyone was talking about the animations, and I was felt that like a layer of the world was not visible <laughs> to me. I just, so I went, and I, I looked at the iPad app, and there it was. I could hear the author reading the text, and then I could also see these cool little animations at the front of every story. Um, <coughs> but then I also got the Kindle application just to see the difference, but they were not visible. Yeah, Kindle um, yeah. doesn't. The Kindle Fire Fire will support audio and video, but the Kindle doesn't. So okay, those don't have it. Well, I used the Kindle app on the iPad, so it didn't. It still. Did. So it's yeah. just a very different like experience. And had I had not had I not talked to people who were talking about the animations, I would have been totally clueless that there was an animation. Mm -hmm. So it would have been fine. I just thought it was interesting that we're all getting a different. I haven't tried it on the iPhone yet. Yeah, I mean, part of trying to accommodate everybody is mm -hmm. that like. Well, you sort of can't, and you, you mm -hmm. try, and you know, like it's hard to get out the information. Like, if you want to look at it on your iPad, then this is what you should get. And if you want, like, I don't know, it's it's. And then we found the YouTube channel that has all your, of most them. of your anime, all, all but, of them, all but the last one. That yeah, you all but yeah. the one that. <coughs> How are we I doing on time? Um, we're fine. Yeah. Another like. I forgot what my question was. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, oh no, that's all right. Um, I, well, I'm I'm just I'm just fascinated by the whole process because I started my life as a writer on a typewriter, <laughs> and used to do gazillions of things. But I get oh I know what I was going to ask was you mentioned hearing the author read. Do you have the author also read the story? Yeah. How great! So, and and does the animation 
just come in automatically with that sentence, or does it? You have to click on it, or yeah, how does it work? Um, I could show you. If you don't. So it's an option right. that people can listen, so or you can, not. You can listen yeah. and read along with the writer if uh -huh. you like. Yeah, which I tried. Although I always read ahead, so it was frustrating. But and yeah. the, the animations don't start automatically. You know, they won't interrupt the, the experience of, of the story if you just want to read. Um, so it's they, they come at the beginning. And you can hit play if you're interested. I love the idea of the, uh, that animation. I think that's thrilling. Thank you. So I'm just opening the uh, issue six enhanced PDF. Mm -hmm. So um, if we wanted, to, maybe we can view. Oh, so if you know, I'll show you just the beginning of a story and what it looks like. So this is what the issue looks like. The interstitials are color, and then. You need to go to one that has. So here's the. This is Matt Summel. This one, the animation's not in yet, but it will be. Um, okay, by Matt Summel. So that's right in there, right in the PDF. And then, um, you know, our animations come in and we update it, and then we like we'll resend it to everyone who has it with the new oh, updated okay. version. Once, um, so I'll just show you. Ah, here we go. So here's three. So then you have, in the story, in the document, we have... This was a small town. Here's the reading by Mark Bash. He came into our office and we recorded him. We have a sound booth. And then, then you can play the animation right from inside the PDF. Yeah. I do compliment you. Uh, one thing with um, some types of online or like uh, electric literature is that there's so many hyperlinks that you get lost and, you're in, and it creates this very kind of fractured experience where you click on the link and you're taken to another place, but you never get to kind of have a continuous experience of reading it. And you don't really do that. The animation is at the front of the story and so is the sound bar, um, but there are no interruptions when you're reading the text. It's just the text. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you want to do something that's hypertextual, like you have to think, you have to be conscious of that and mm -hmm. create a hypertextual experience. Right. We may do that. You know, that is interesting to be able to click on something in a story and then see a picture of the, the cafe. But, mm -hmm. you know, we haven't done that. It's not, it's not intrusive it. in the actual experience of reading. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so if we're finished with questions, I think we'll just sort of. Have an you can informally come up and talk to Halima and Ben. Um, they'll get to eat their sandwiches. And um, then those of us who are in the class will make our way over to Bennett Hall. Um, and um, I want to thank you so much for coming and for giving us this really unusual sort of audiovisual experience with the literary magazine. Thank Thanks you. For having us. Yeah. Oh, and copies are for sale in the back um, for a reasonable holiday special price, too. Mm -hmm. yeah.